Hi, my name is Matthew Lewis, and I do the voice of Kaisel Bakshi, along with all the additional voices in The Forgotten Minotaur King. I hope you enjoy the podcast and continue to listen into the future. If you want to support my content, please donate to my Patreon, Matthew Lewis Podcasts. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Matthew Lewis Podcasts. All one word. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Matthew Lewis P. Or leave a positive maximum star review on your podcast app of choice. If you found this podcast, I assume you're familiar enough with the genre to know how important reviews are to the survival of a channel. Uh, and I hope you recommend this to your friends. Or if you didn't like it, uh, you could recommend it to your enemies. And I'll teach them a lesson. Uh, keep it sleazy, folks. And thank you. What do you think of when you hear the word Minotaur? Do you think of perhaps a terrifying monster that has kidnapped a fair maiden? Do you think of wandering nomadic family tribes? Or do you think of a jumped up farm animal that learned how to wield a tool or something? Or do you perhaps think of a noble and possibly misunderstood king? I am speaking of the mysterious and short-lived reign of the brutal bovine big shot known only as Krunterg. My name is Kaisel Bakshi. I am a spry 23-year-old human male, medium height, a somewhat doughy complexion from too much time indoors, and someone with a healthy thirst for the art of scholarship. I hail from Saguardi's University, comfortably located in a little kingdom called Wolfkeep, which I have lived in my whole life with my loving mother and father, as well as many older and younger siblings. I have attended the university for more than a few years now, and my voyage has almost reached its end. My penultimate goal is to create something of lasting value for the university and for the city of Wolfkeep at large. If you have heard of Wolfkeep, you'd know of our tumultuous history with unconventional leadership. Our very own king, His Royal Highness Ludopagus' rise to the throne, was quite controversial. Many citizens were not ready for a non-human ruler. A Samazatori, or Frogman, as they are more colloquially known, as well as one with a dubious history with the previous royal family, specifically the late King Pandolfo Wolfkeep, the family being our kingdom's namesake, and his still-missing son, Prince Darlington. But that is not the subject of this tome. This great work I have chosen to transcribe for future knowledge seekers came to me when the Seguardes University's lead professor of Nobile Lexicanum, Dr. Kornblau, had the entire seminar read her publication on the 100-year history of the Rajal Assad empires. The Rajal Assad are, as it is well known, catfolk, or Rakshasi, as they are referred to in their own native language. They are and have been one of the largest empirical dynasties in the history of the planet. Among the fantastically chronicled stories of dragon slaying Leonites and the complete annihilation of abyss dwelling deep creatures, there was an event that truly struck me. Among the sections pertaining to their current reign, a passage offhandedly mentions a usurpation of their long-term ally, the Mindus royal family. An aristocracy of mostly humanoid members, gifted with the most peculiar ability of chrysopia. Meaning, for some members, their very touch or even a stern glare could reduce their enemies to solid gold. The entire lineage of this great house disappeared approximately a decade past. When I asked Dr. Kornblau about this, she told me that at the time of her research, all she could uncover was an altercation between King Birk Mindus and a potentially quite villainous minotaur named Krumturk. When I sat down with Professor Kornblau 
For more information, this is what she had to say. Oh, these office chairs are quite uncomfortable. Now, young man, let me see just what I can recall about this Krunturk fellow. When I mailed out requests for current information regarding the Rajal Assad family's recent activities, I received word of a despot that they have had quite a few violent encounters with Mr. Bakshi. This particular passage in my book was information I received by letter a few years after the events. This minotaur was apparently some kind of sadistic criminal or crazed assassin that had taken over the Mindus royal kingdom of Goldenerad and attempted to begin a horrific war against an adjacent Rajelasad province. You received a letter you didn't go yourself to gather information? Heavens no! I'm far too elderly to travel to such faraway lands. Why do that when a perfectly civil letter can get the job done? Those places aren't as developed and well protected as our home is. The things you hear about from the West. My correspondence was a former town's guard that witnessed these horrid events firsthand. He says the evil creature slew the king and took the throne only to repeatedly abdicate it, eventually leaving the town of Goldenerat leaderless. But who was he? Why did he leave? Why did he leave? Well, I don't know. He may have just been that mentally unwell. And Goldenerad has had such a reputation as a beacon for the mentally abnormal to seek asylum. Now, is that all, young man? I have classes to teach and tomes to fact check. Once the professor had left, I had some time to process this information. This was astonishing. It sent me reeling at my desk. Who was this psychopath? Why would a lone minotaur take over a small town like Goldenerod? How? How could he achieve such a feat? And where was he from? It was then and there that I had my realization. There must be more to this than aimless regicide. I took to the library to uncover everything I could. These events had only transpired a little beyond a decade ago. So there must be records, I thought, only to come up nearly empty-handed. How could this be? Why was there not more information? And if no one else was to present the truth, it was my duty. Now, I would not be entirely truthful if I didn't acknowledge the fact that this potential quest had rekindled a spark from my old responsibilityless youth when I wanted to become an adventurer, or maybe even a noble knight, or at the very least a city guard. Many a bump and bruise were gained from a young and always roughhousing Kaisel Bakshi. Of course, given our glorious king, His Royal Highness Ludope, has long since abolished the need for such things with his orc and ogre husbandry programs to make a superior protective force, accompanied with the mandatory neurological re-education of all governing and military personnel, the city is in as safe of hands as it possibly could be. And I eventually discovered my true path and passion the preservation and discovery of knowledge. I once again approached Dr. Kornblau and inquired if I could see the letter from this guard. Perhaps I could glean further insight into these events. The now former town guard had sent the doctor quite a few letters I will now report the first one she received. Uh, hello, Mrs. Dr. Professor. 
My name is Mudge Gangrel, and I saw your advertisement for information what regarding that Mendes family. Wells, I was a guard in town for not 20 years. Oh, the lovely golden ride. I was there when the Mendeses were so callously struck down by the most evil of creatures. A minotaur, what calling himself Krunterg, was in the town for who knows what. Killed the king in cold blood, I heard. A and maybe sold his two daughters to princesses. I'm not quite sure about that one. And just about killed half the knights patrolling the castle when he did all that. I myself had caught a bit of a stomach bug and was not on duty the day these events took place. Well, at once... That awful bull man took the throne, I sure as the whole of Vecna twerk gonna work for no beast man like that. So I hightailed it to the edge of town and kept my nose high and my eyes shut for the rest of my days. I hope that helps your book, Mrs. Dr. Professor. I look forward to my big bag of compensation for this letter. Now it was clear to me why Dr. Cornblow had such little information. It was also clear to me, with testimonies like this, doing my own research in person rather than relying on letters might be more difficult than I thought. Knowing I would likely need aid in this pursuit, I approached a good friend of mine, Ahani Rawu, who has been training to become a scripter, one who transcribes speeches at events and records the notes during important assemblages, as rare as those kinds of things are these days. I would explain to her my idea for a tome exploring this bloody and suspicious event. I would explain why I need her aid in dictating my every step and stutter on the way. Here is the letter that I wrote her. My dearest and oldest friend, Ahani Rawu, I know it has been some time since our last correspondence, but I have the venture of a lifetime prepared for the two of us. I plan to travel to Goldinarod to investigate the events surrounding the assassination of a king and the desolation of his house and lineage. To compile this information into a tome is my primary design. The journey may be fraught with perils, and I don't have much of a hand at on-the-spot dictation as you would, my illustrious friend. Will you accompany me into this world of intrigue? I promise compensation for the quality of your work and copious acknowledgments in the resulting tome and publication. Please respond in letter if possible, or in verbal confirmation when next we meet. The following day, she appeared on my university housing's doorstep, numerous writing implements, blotters, journals, parchments in hand. I was glad to see she had readily agreed to accompany me. I had met Ahani during my early years at Seguardes University. We had entered similar fields of education. Literature is one of the few pursuits His Royal Highness allows the citizens, so to find someone with a close passion that mirrored my own meant our friendship was all but guaranteed. Half-dwarves, such as Ahani, are quite rare across the world. I note that she finds the proper term, mule, to be pejorative because of its connotations to the animal, mule. My next step was to explain this sudden departure to those close to me. First, my family, leaving out the more disturbing subjects of my research to keep them from anguishing over my potential lack of safety. Then, my colleagues and group housing flatmates. Not fully grasping the length of this venture, I didn't want to potentially leave a room unoccupied indefinitely, forcing another student to sleep in the administration building, as so many less fortunates already do. And finally, my superiors in the university. They are the ones that this tome's ultimate fate relies on. Should it not be up to standard, or one of His Royal Highness's demarkers deems it discordant, it may never see the dim lighting of a library. I then began to gather traveling supplies. 
rope and crampons, in case the gods aren't kind, and we find ourselves in need of climbing, plenty of pickled and preserved rations of food, should Golden Aradian cuisine not quite match our palates, and comfortable changes in clothes. The nearby desert may hold further discoveries for my book. And of course, suitably large trunks to contain our research implements. Our true and final steps will be to schedule a coach to take us out of town at a reasonable time, and to procure some protection for Ahani and myself. For this last part, we will have to travel to the barrios of Wolfkeep and find ourselves some streetwise guardians. But that'll be covered in my next chapter. <laughs>